Assalamualaikum everyone and welcome to another episode of The Sculpt here on British Muslim TV with me, your host, Wakar Rizvi. In this week's episode, we're going to be discussing energy geopolitics, specifically surrounding the Middle East region. And we're going to be honing in on three topics, and we may not get to all three, but we're going to try to discuss these in, in macro terms as well. But the first is, of course, the Israeli-Lebanese maritime dispute over oil and gas exploration in the East Mediterranean. And that has put a spotlight, of course, on their dispute, uh, which continues very much so over maritime boundaries. We know a U.S. official um, or an American official, I should say, is trying to mediate between those two at this point about that maritime borderline dispute. A second issue is the EU, the European Union, signing an agreement which will see natural gas from Israel, Egypt, and other sources in the East Mediterranean being shipped to Europe via Egypt's liquefied natural gas export infrastructure. And all of that, of course, is an EU effort to overcome its dependence on Russian energy imports. And then finally, and quite importantly as well, is confusion, which continues at this point in time about whether or not the U.S. president will really be meeting Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, because that would mean possibly that he will probably be really discussing oil prices, energy supplies, etc., and possibly asking MBS for help in reducing energy prices around the world. Let's discuss all of those issues a bit further. We're not joined by Dr. Nikolai Dugunderson, who is a lecturer of post-conflict resolution at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And we're also joined by Dr. Atlef Lorsi, who is a professor emeritus of economics at McMaster University. Atif and Nikolai, thank you both for taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, Atif, I'd like to start with you, if I may, and start right at the top. As, as I mentioned, the Israeli-Lebanese disagreement over their maritime boundaries. And there's a lot at stake here, right? Um, and certainly for the Lebanese, more so seemingly because of their economy. Uh, there is so much at stake here. Uh, the uh, Levantine Basin is uh, a place where there is 122 trillion cubic meter of, of gas and about 1.7 billion barrels of oil. And it's shared in the sense that uh, the environment and these uh, deposits don't obey national borders. So to a great extent here, what we have is a situation in which this resource in common, a shared resource. And there are no real principles how to deal with it, except that no one party should exploit that resource to the detriment and to the uh, contrary interest of other riparian, other uh, people who share it with. And the total amount of money is, is, is a huge. 2017, I estimated that there is about $524 billion, mostly gas, about $450 billion. But these are at prices of 2017. Today, the price of oil is four or five times what it used to be. And the price of natural gas is two and a half times what it was. So there is really quite a bit in the shared area and for Lebanon that is now going through the throes of one of the most historic uh, and unique uh, uh, problems that the World Bank says is one of the three worst economic crises since 1850. Uh, the yeah. promise, the capacity uh, to benefit from these uh, resources is a lifesaver and uh, there is so much at stake here. So, I mean, you know, Nikolai, we, we have the Americans who are trying to seemingly uh, mediate between these two parties at this time. Uh, I, I know that this probably sounds very cynical, but can they really be trusted at this time to, to take a balanced view on this, considering they're, you know, uh, Israel is a special ally for them in the region? I'm glad you brought that up because that was uh, the first thought on my mind that the United States already sees Israel as a main security ally. And I think that Israel will take advantage of that. But in addition to that, I think that what they would try to sell Israel is this image of certainty. So Lebanon itself, not only have they tried to change the boundary and the economic crisis could be feeding into that, but on top of that, Lebanon has been told by certain energy firms like Total that they will not extract any gas deposits until the dispute is resolved. Israel does not seem to have this issue, and they know it. And I think that they are definitely going to lean on the United States to try to ensure a more favorable outcome. Ultimately, as well, I would say that uncertainty scares investors. 
uncertainty scares energy companies. And there is a lot of uncertainty in Lebanon, whereas Israel would say, well, you know, we have the deals that we want to have. We have um, energy companies operating right now, and we don't have Lebanon's uncertainty or instability. Hmm. I wonder, though, Atif, you know, and, and a huge elephant in the room is, of course, the fact that the Lebanese and Israelis just don't get along anyways, right? They have major political issues between the two sides anyways. We can talk about Hezbollah, for example, as well. And Hezbollah has come out and warned the Israelis, saying that you better not take our you know, nat natural resources uh, that belong to the Lebanese nation. Um, all of that is a huge obstacle in this regard, isn't it? Well, look, I mean, there is quite a bit of suspicion here. There is no trust between the two parties. And the Lebanese at this moment feel that maybe, especially the last provocative action, a ship, the energy, uh, is in disputed waters and presumably coming to be start drilling. Uh, the Lebanese see this as their lifeline to a economic recovery. And they're not prepared and very reticent. And as you said, there is not only, uh, you know, the Lebanese uh, state, I mean, Hezbollah is in South Lebanon, uh, is in the area where the Israelis are uh, trying to drill. So this is a, an issue that is not likely to pass lightly. And given the state of this trust between the parties and the fact that there are many Lebanese who are fortunately find it very difficult to trust the Americans as being honest brokers. Uh, the uh, emissary who had come to uh, deal with the situation has served with the Israeli army in occupying Lebanon. So to some extent, this idea of confidence building that is necessary, important for any negotiation to be conducted in an objective way that would uh, give trust and confidence to the parties that there would be at the end, a fair solution is not there. You know, uh, at the same time, Nikolai, everyone keeps saying that um, Hezbollah doesn't want a war. And I mean, that's something that Hezbollah has said itself as well. But I mean, is this because the numbers that, that Atif, you know, started off with, those are huge numbers. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, do you think that Lebanese would actually go to war over this? I'm not sure if Hezbollah would make that move, although Israel has said that they're going to mobilize their Iron Dome anti-missile system at some point to protect what they consider to be their gas deposits. Uh, we do have to remember, though, that Lebanon is dealing with a very, very difficult economic situation. And I think another aspect that we can discuss isn't just distrust between Lebanon and Israel, but perhaps to a degree we can talk about distrust between the Lebanese government and the Lebanese people. I mean, we've seen that Lebanon, sadly, is a country where a lot of people, if they can leave, they have done so because of the economy, we had the 2020 port explosion, which was seen as being caused by complete neglect. And so I think that also there's this issue of whether or not the government is able to fight for energy and for resources that should be used on behalf of the people. There's that angle as well. Indeed. And, you know, Atif, I wanted to, if you allow me, bring in the EU as well, because I wanted to speak about these external influences then on energy geopolitics in the region. Right. So, for example, with the European Union, who, as we know, has been desperately looking for alternative suppliers to the likes of the Russians. Um, and they've now found that in this deal that they've signed with the Israelis and the Egyptians. Um, that also then strengthens, in a sense, Israel's hand in the region, right? So, I mean, that then solidifies the relationship that then politically means that the uh, Europeans will not then be, um, even, even if they try to, more neutral brokers of peace, possibly for Palestinians as well? I mean, look, it's shared and it's not shared only between the Lebanese and the Israelis, as also the Palestinians and the Greeks. Uh, you know, in Cyprus, the uh, Egyptians, the, all the others in that Levantine basin that borders so many countries. But the real problem now is the new geopolitical situation that is developing in the aftermath of uh, the Ukraine war. All of a sudden, Europe finds itself that depends to the tune of 48% or more on Russian gas is now... Uh, facing a situation where the Nord Stream 1 is not working. And, and now they just blame Canada because there is a compressor that Siemens brought in and the Canadians have impounded it. And the, the Russians are saying, no, we cannot even deliver uh, these, this gas 
and has already stopped gas to Bulgaria and Poland. The story is that now all of a sudden the Middle East is shaping up to be in a position where they would replace, or this is the hope or the uh, design of the Americans and the Europeans that maybe the Middle East would be the place where you could replace and make up for the shortages and shortfall in uh, Russian supplies of gas. The story is that how would the Russians take this? And they're not far away. They're in Syria. They're on the border too. To a great extent, the situation is not so simple. It's, it's extremely complicated, extremely dangerous. Uh, the chances that it would somehow uh, go into a conflict is, is very high and very real. And the story is that at the moment, unfortunately, uh, the Israelis are already taking the gas, sending it to Egypt, where it is mm. uh, liquefied and is sold to Europe. And uh, to a great extent, many parties in the region are saying, hey, wait a minute, where is our share and how are we going to believe that you are getting this gas from your area and not from the common area or from our area that we claim to be in our exclusive economic zone. So the situation is quite complicated. The prices are so high, the stakes are so high, and uh, this is really what makes this situation all the more a tinderbox. Indeed, just under 30 seconds of you can, Nikolai, before I go into the break, what are your thoughts about the fact that the Israeli hand has not been strengthened with this EU deal? It's certainly a problem for Lebanon. Uh, the EU has actually criticized Lebanon for so-called unnecessary disputes. So now we're seeing that Israel has on the one hand the EU and on the other hand the US, these two Western partners that are seeing Israel as possibly a stable energy supplier and security partner. So uh, I think right now things don't look too good for Lebanon. Indeed. Well, we'll be back right after this break. Um, we're going to go into a break just very soon, and we're going to be back, of course, with Atav and Nikolai right after that break, discussing, uh, of course, geopolitics in the region. And we haven't yet discussed, certainly, Biden's upcoming visit to the Middle East, and there's huge issues surrounding that as well, because there's a lot of a lot of stake, of course, for the Americans when it comes to energy supplies and energy prices around the world as well. We will certainly bring that up as well as continuing, of course, the, the issue of the EU and that deal that it has signed with the Israelis and the Egyptians. There are huge implications, certainly, as well for the Palestinians. And as Atif there was discussing for other Middle Eastern players as well. Stay with us for that. I'll be back right after this break. Welcome back, everyone. You're still here in the scope with me, Wakar Rizvi, your host, and we continue to discuss the issue of geopolitics, energy geopolitics in the Middle East region with Nikolai T. Anderson and Atif Versi. Uh, Nikolai, I wanted to start off this segment with you and ask you about the fact that, you know, not too long ago, we started speaking about the Middle East region as almost post America, right? Where especially the Iranians were already pushing for that sort of. Uh, you know, idea that, hey, the Americans are now leaving the region, they're withdrawing from the region. But am I right to say then because of what's happened in Ukraine, that it, that's sort of now the opposite, where the Americans and the Europeans are now ever more involved in the Middle East because they really now depend on it. And then there's that danger, again, as Atif mentioned, of siphoning off essentially the region's resources. Well, certainly, I think that the United States has always had a strategic interest in the Middle East. And even if certain presidents claimed that they would reduce active forces in the Middle East, I don't believe that the geopolitics of the region will stop being of interest to the United States. So I do think that recently, yes, what happened with uh, Russia annexing Ukraine and also starting to perhaps cut off supply has affected U.S. interest in the region. Uh, we've also had COVID and increased oil and gas prices, which is also something that perhaps the United States had not foreseen. Biden, when he gave his opening um, speech, when he was inaugurated, said we want to lead by the power of our example, not the example of our power. But we really start to see right now, it's like it's back to business as usual for the United States and the Middle East. But, you know, Atif, uh, you know, the Middle Eastern countries have, have now strengthened their hand over these years, right? I mean, these are not yesterday's Arab powers or, you know, Muslim countries. They are smarter now, am I right to say, when it comes to trade negotiations, um, energy negotiations, trade deals, etc. So, I mean, this will not be a walk in the park for the Americans and the Europeans to just come in and say, please help us when it comes to energy prices, supplies, etc. 
Yeah, you are absolutely right. I mean, there are lots of issues that are still at the table. I mean, we typically have one elephant in the room. This time we have two elephants in the room, the Ukraine-Russian war and the failure to come to an agreement on the nuclear uh, uh, treaty with the Iranians. So the two factors are combining here. And there is something that has really been a real problem uh, for the parties in the Middle East. To some extent, uh, the Saudis and the people in the Gulf felt that maybe the US should have really been more forthcoming and more consultative with them with any agreement uh, with Iran. And they felt that probably they were not. And to, to some extent, the failure to come to an agreement is in the background of what's happening here, uh, there is an intended trip by President Biden to the region, and uh, there is really this uh, concern that maybe now uh, it's going to see to what extent can we bring the Israelis and the Gulf people together as a, an alliance uh, to face Iran. Uh, there is a disconnect between the people and governments in the Middle East, and what the Americans are doing are playing the side of the government, but not paying enough attention to what used to be the Arab streets. So there is here a situation, a, a very uh, good uh, minefield, so to speak, to be able to navigate through it in a way that, uh, yes, uh, you want to bring some alliances in the Middle East, but uh, what are you really going to do uh, with the general feeling that yesterday Israel and today still is pro occupying and in many respect uh, uh, thwarting any independence for the Palestinians. And occupation is the longest occupation, all right? I mean, from 1967 today, uh, the uh, Israelis keep expanding their illegal settlements. Uh, the uh, Palestinian economy is literally uh, dispossessed. Uh, they have set back really any potential for the Palestinians uh, to yeah. eat a independent living. Indeed. So this guy kind of Nikolai, yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, Nikolai, I, I wonder, you know, when it comes to, for example, MBS specifically in Saudi Arabia, if I may hone in on that example for a moment, because there's you know, a lot of talk about that, as you were well aware of in the media, um, you know, huge speculation, will Biden, will Biden not be meeting MBS? I mean, it's still a huge question mark on that. Um, but regardless of or not of whether that meeting happens, I mean, uh, the Arab hand has been strengthened over the years. Am I right to say that, Nikolai? Unfortunately, I would say that the, the Arab hand of regimes has been strengthened in the sense that we don't just have rising oil and gas prices. Let's remember that many of the regimes survived the Arab Spring in the Gulf. The Abraham Accords, I think, also are going ahead for that partial reason that regimes say, well, if we can survive the Arab Spring, do we need to listen to our citizens or to the people? And the United States cares about its regional security. So the ability to normalize with Israel, to have Gulf states working overtly as opposed to covertly with Israel is certainly something that Biden would want and that the United States would want. Saudi Arabia is not in a full position yet, I think, to openly embrace Israel, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that they will discuss should Biden meet MBS. In addition to that, I'll just quickly add that I think that within the ruling family, whoever supported MBS has a lot of stake in ensuring that he remains in power. That means that even after the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi, those uh, pillars, those forces that came together to support him as Crown Prince will not really be able to afford to say, okay, we're going to back away from this now. They're, they're, too, they're in too deep, effectively. So I think that MBS still has a lot of domestic power, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is a meeting and that the royal family itself, including the current uh, king, pushes for that meeting where Biden and MBS personally meet. So, I mean, you know, Atif, uh, if a meeting like that were to even happen, for example, I mean, and this is obviously just looking into a crystal ball, but I mean, whose hand is stronger in this case? I mean, the Americans obviously want lower energy prices. They're already, the American people are already hurting at the, at the petrol pumps. Um, but MBS certainly would want something in return, wouldn't it? Well, look, I mean, to some extent, there is self-interest here. What's the self-interest of Saudis who had suffered quite a bit 
particularly in 19, uh, 2020, when the price of oil was below $20 a barrel. Now it's a time for them to replenish, uh, to compensate for all what they have lost when the prices of oil was so low, and to some extent was even pushed lower in the expectation that the U.S., that used to be a net importer uh, of oil, had become a, a net exporter. Uh, the issue here is also uh, the situation where uh, Mr. Biden is not going to survive the midterm elections if the price of uh, oil at the pump is over $5 a gallon. Uh, it's hurting, you know, it's hurting every day. I mean, this is not something theoretical for the Americans. They're paying for it, and they're hurting. And to a great extent, there are forces that are trying to pin this responsibility on Biden. So he has a lot of stake, and he is really counting, dependent, and, and he's trying his best to see to what extent FBS is going to accommodate. Uh, the story is... Saudi Arabia has to choose. Uh, Saudi Arabia has to reconcile its domestic and its uh, national interests versus trying to be on the side, ac helping, accommodating uh, Mr. Biden when they felt that to some extent after Khashoggi's, uh, you know, murder, uh, you know, he went on record uh, blaming the Saudis and blaming MBS himself. You know, as we were as we were discussing there, Nikolai, I couldn't help but think of the real politic of the region, right? So we've had, for example, um, Turkey reaching out and and bettering its relations both with the Persian Gulf countries that it was not getting along with for a significant amount of time, and then also the Israelis, right? And I, I bring that in because I feel like, it, it, and I wanted to ask you, is that a good example of the fact that? when your economy starts suffering as the Turkish economy was and arguably still is, that you then have to just, you know, you have to go beyond what you once preferred morally, possibly, as your stances and just, you know, reach across that, that fence, so to speak. Well, I think there's, as my colleague Atif mentioned, there's self-interest, but there's also survival. And let's not forget that COVID has battered a lot of economies and it is also an event that many regimes did not see coming, including, I think, Turkey. So I do believe that, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And we certainly are seeing some of that across the Middle East. And so what does that mean about, you know, how Turkey, uh, as a NATO member, then designs its politics going forward, right? Because it's really important. I mean, uh, Turkey has a huge role to play even within, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine it certainly doesn't. It does, and I think that it will have to measure its options very carefully. I think also, again, Erdogan, he is a survivor, but I think that over the past few years, his popularity has been affected by the skirmishes in Syria, the fact that the economy has been battered, and this will be his priority. So he will start to reform his alliances based on probably economic interests. And certainly, the Gulf states are known for their willingness to provide, in some cases, generous aid and financial packages, but with a lot of strings attached. Indeed. Uh, Atif, I'll give you the final word. We just have about two minutes left, just under two minutes. Uh, what are your thoughts about Turkey and its changing stances now because of economic realities? Well, I mean, Turkey has a problem uh, of its own. I mean, uh, with the Syrians and uh, uh, with the Aegean Sea. So the issues for Turkey are quite uh, complex. And uh, one has to take into account that the uh, Turkish economy that was doing extremely well has not been doing very well. And the inflation rate is extremely high. The Turkish pound now is at one of its lowest values. And uh, to a great extent, Turkey felt that uh, it has been excluded from any oil. You know, everybody around them, they have the oil except them. And they're trying through Cyprus, particularly the Turkish side, to really get is, their hands on some of the uh, wells and share in it. But it doesn't seem to be really coming here. The story is to what extent can they, and they have forged a bit of a alliance with Qatar and see, thinking, you know, somehow, the story used to be, all right, the Americans, the Turks, everybody else was counting and hoping that uh, they will have a pipeline from Qatar, from the Gulf, all the way to Europe. Syria has, and Russia being right there in Syria, has made this possibility that much distant. Uh, to a great extent, Turkey felt like it really lost, but then it was getting... Yeah. 
some of these pipelines going through it. So there is really here a delicate balance right. for the Turks. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I have to leave it there at that, but I sincerely appreciate both Atif and Nikolai for taking their time. As I said, they're no doubt very busy schedules, but we really appreciate their insight. We, we covered quite a bit. We spoke about Israeli-Lebanon uh, maritime dispute. We spoke about the EU, as well as the Americans, of course, reaching out to the region, uh, looking to overcome the many energy issues that they're having because of the situation in Ukraine. And of course, then towards the end there, we spoke about Turkey, which is also an extremely important player. As I said, uh, it is a NATO member. It's very heavily involved in trying to resolve the situation in Ukraine, etc. We will, of course, be back next week with another very hot topic of the week. So do ensure you stay tuned and join us next week as well. But as I said, we really appreciate both Nikolai Duke Anderson and Anna Kobersi. From me, Wakar Rizvi, thank you very much for watching this edition of The Scope here on BMTV.